Right. Uh, good afternoon. I think uh, just see some people at the back. Um, this is uh, one of these ludicrously overambitious titles, you know, Global Domination, an Easy Step How-To Guide. Um, I think I'd rather than try and be too prescriptive is really share some of the experiences we've had and draw out some themes. Um, but actually what I'd most like to do is uh, leave a bit of time for anyone to actually like to have uh, a bit more of an interactive question and answer because I think everyone going down the journey of growing a retail business around the world will have different experiences and different challenges. And actually it's one of the things that as a retail industry we can really help each other with um, because a lot of the mistakes, frankly, that we've all made are, are pretty similar. So this is uh, an attempt to really sort of group it into um, three or four main, main points. Firstly, for retailers, uh, it's not like being um, some uh, fast-moving consumer good or a technical product. Uh, you don't take one product and take it around the world. This is taking a business model and reinventing it in different places around the world. Now, to do that, you have to really understand why you create any value for people. And I'll come back to uh, some things on that, but a lot of the mistakes uh, retailers have made is they don't really understand why necessarily they're making money in, in, in their home country. They then go overseas to another country and completely screw it up um, because they're simply repeating what they don't understand uh, from one country to the next. Second is choosing where to compete. Um, there is no such thing as the world. There are a series of cities, a series of countries, a series of regions. And actually, they are not even. The competitive situation, the challenge you're going to face is so different place from place. And even within uh, countries, if you look at somewhere like Russia, where we're very active out there recently, actually about 25% of the entire retail market in Russia sits inside the equivalent of the M25 around Moscow. So that is a different market from the rest. Uh, if you go to Omsk uh, in deeper Siberia, you're going to see a rather different cu customer and competitive uh, situation. So you really have to think, where do I want to be? Because simply plonking down stores and assuming you can be there uh, is unlikely to succeed. Third question is, how do you go to market? Um, there are lots of different ways in which you can enter. You can decide, uh, you know, do I go myself? I go with partners. I go in franchise. Uh, go initially maybe through agents. And increasingly now, for quite a lot of retailers, and I know Nick uh, at ASOS has had this, you can actually go without opening a single store, which is an extraordinary development for retailers who can actually project businesses around the world on the back of no physical presence. So you have to think very hard about what you do and also at what uh, period of your development. And the final uh, theme I'll come back to is uh, focus on execution. I mean, we know that there is a cliche about retail is detail. Unfortunately, that is a cliche that's completely true. And when you go internationally, if you don't get the execution right, you can be starting with great product, great ideas, great potential, interesting competitive space, and you can still screw it up. And the thing uh, I keep mentioning screwing it up because I have to tell you the history of most retailers trying to go internationally is actually of failure. More people have failed than succeeded. And if you start with that in mind that says, actually, this is going to be quite difficult, and if I don't pay attention to this, I'm probably going to get it wrong, you're more likely to succeed than someone who just drifts into a country and said, you know, I've vis visited this place a few times, it looks okay, we'll give it a punt. So you really have to think very hard about the detail of execution, even after you've done the other more, if you like, strategic bits and pieces. So if those are the, um, the broad headlines, I'm just going to um, drive through a few, few examples and a few points on each, and starting about the value drivers. Um, retailing has got a plethora of different models, um, from, if you like, a purely local, say, food-based retailer to a very centralized um, global, say, the luxury brands, uh, or even people like IKEA, who are essentially taking the same uh, eight to 11,000 SKUs and pushing them out uh, all across the world. Now, if you have a global sourcing model, you are much more likely to have, frankly, success when it comes to international expansion because you are essentially leveraging what you've got across a much bigger geography. And as long as the consumer tastes are roughly the same, you can actually sell to a much bigger audience. And what I find interesting about the IKEA experiment is there's a lot of mythology about local global sourcing. And people have traditionally come from much more local sourcing and find it difficult to think about becoming more global. It's certainly the journey we at Kingfisher are on. We have stores like B&Q, the equivalent of Casserama in France. They are essentially parallel businesses, 
and only 2% of our products are actually the same. They, they all look the same. The power tool is a power tool, a bit of wood is a bit of wood. Actually, it's only 2% identical. So for us, we've essentially got local source businesses that aren't leveraging the global opportunity. But if you're global and you're IKEA, you've been able to take these products everywhere, drive huge volumes, reinvest that in price, which keeps driving the volume. And that, as a model, is much more exportable because the more local you are, the more you have to adapt the offer each time, and particularly in something like food, you end up having to essentially recreate a business from scratch, as opposed to bringing a ready-made set of products. And one of the reasons why the clothing guys have done, I think, so well in so many markets is you come with a complete collection. There it is. There's a product. At the moment, if I try and take B&Q to Saudi Arabia, like George, I've only got probably 2,000 products I can give them out of our global sourcing. Uh, hopefully, in a few years' time, that will be different, but I have to go and recreate a new business. So that's going to make it much harder for me to grow a business. Um, secondly is cost structures. Um, what works in certain markets works for reasons to do with actual really structural costs. You know, one of the reasons to take DIY, why does DIY work in Western Europe? It's because the cost of labor is incredibly expensive, and so people have a real incentive to fix up their own place and do it themselves. And although there has been more do it for me over the last few years, that economic driver uh, is still incredibly important for people. When you then transpose a DIY model to China, where actually the cost of labor is incredibly low, you can't actually create DIY, and as a result, DIY doesn't exist. We have a business of 40 stores in China, but um, any one of our customers who can afford to buy the product can afford to hire someone to actually put the product in. And we, we did a, uh, a test in, our, in the buying teams at, in Shanghai, uh, asked 200 people in the office how many, how many of the Chinese, uh, how many of the total team have uh, their own any form of power tool. And two people out of 200 put their arms, uh, hands up. One was a Brit, one was a Frenchman. There were no Chinese that owned anything. And that's the point when you realize, actually, it makes sense because the economic cost structure is completely different. Other example of this is in uh, India where the cost of labor is very low, but actually the cost of land where you'd like to be is incredibly high. So if your model is a big box self-service DIY shop, you're probably not going to make any money there for another sort of 20 years. But you need to understand, you know, what are the important drivers there and which ones are actually where you create the value. So for us, you know, we've now flexed. We've got different models. We've got a small model uh, in the shape of um, both Brico Depot and Screwfix. And for some of our markets where we're looking at the future, we will probably take a screw fix model of you know, uh, five to 10,000 square feet, internet-enabled shop, rather than plonk down a major 90,000 square foot big box, because the cost structures are that different. The final thing about cost structures I, I would add is um, you've got to be very, very aware, um, particularly around, I think, for retailers, the cost of space and the relative uh, returns you're likely to get. And some of these markets are just genuinely difficult. The cost of space is very high. The returns are pretty low. And in some cases, you've got real structural, structural problems. So being very aware of how do I make money. And the big, biggest issue with these um, approaches is that people don't tend to look at them consciously. They tend to say, well, look, hold on. I make money in the UK or I make money in France. I'll just export it because surely it's the same. And actually, the variations in these are massive. You know, in France, land is a lot cheaper. Labor is more expensive than the UK. So that's created a bigger shop and a real focus on productivity because it's so expensive to hire French people. Or technically, actually, it's so expensive to fire them that you don't hire them in the first place. Um, so you've got, you've got a real understanding there. It says, actually, these are different, different countries, different dynamics. How do you, as retailers, adapt your business model to make that work? Um, the final bit is competitive skills. You know, what is it that you're good at that creates the money that allows you to earn money as a, as a retailer? And I think there's a danger here, particularly for some of the more legacy brands who say are successful in one place and uh, you know, have tended to then say, well, it works here, so I'll go to other places. And actually, what they don't understand is that maybe in their own market, they are relatively competitive and, and that they've got something new. I think the huge challenge for Mark and the team at M&S, going back into the clothing market in Europe, when they left, frankly, people like Zara and H&M weren't really very present. That competitive landscape has changed so much, and the skills you now requ you require to be better have gone from here to there. And actually, you're going to struggle to bring something which you might think is an advantage in your own market, but actually doesn't play out in another market. So, 
being really honest with yourself, and I think the danger here is that most retailers, certainly the, you know, 30 years in retail and I've worked, most retailers are natural optimists. We'll figure out, we'll, we'll work out how to do it, and anyway, we're better than the next guy. And there's a real danger there that you get convinced that you can actually do this stuff, and you tend to view the local competitors as a bunch of Muppets who couldn't retail their way out of a paper bag. You get there and you find actually they're rather good. And particularly, I'd warn you, if anyone in this room is interested in going to China, you better come with some really distinctive product because their margins, their costs, and their promotions are far more intense than anything you'll see in Western Europe. So think about your value drivers. How do I make money? Why do I make money? Are those assumptions true when I go to another country? So if I'm thinking about that and thinking, OK, I can pass that first test. There is something I can do. Um, I'm not simply <clears throat> a local player that doesn't bring any advantage to this new market. Then I think you get to the second question, which is, OK, where do I want to compete? And we've done a series. Um, we're currently in eight countries around the world. Uh, only 40% of Kingfisher is inside the UK with B&Q and Screwfix. So the majority of what we do is, is outside, notably in France uh, and then Poland. Um, but one, one of the things I'd say is that there are enormous differences between individual countries. And I think for most retailers, with the exception maybe of the internet players, actually the country block is the most significant because you have to basically work around a legal system, a language often, tax, everything else, you name it. It tends to work in a block like that. The other way you can think about it is a city-by-city city approach. I think particularly at the top end, in luxury brands, you probably need to think cities rather than countries. For most mass market retailers, you need to think about countries because you need scale and you need them to be growing. Scale is a big issue. We've got a rough rule of thumb. It's not incredibly scientific. It says that at the moment, if it hasn't got 20 million people in it, we won't go to that country because it, it's difficult to sustain a business in terms of the central overhead, DCs, uh, all the things you need to develop a business if you can't ultimately grow a bigger business beyond it. Other people can survive on much smaller numbers. And uh, you can do this differently as a smaller retailer. Uh, talking to Angus Thurwell from Hotel Chocolat today, he's shipping product from Huntingdon to Copenhagen and Manhattan, which is the most extraordinary. But I now know that chocolate lasts rather longer than I thought it did, and he can make, the, uh, he can make it work. Most people who are setting up scale businesses, you, you have to have some size, and you want to be in markets, obviously, that are growing. So for us, Western Europe is going to be you know, flat to difficult, probably, for the next few years. Russia, by contrast, is growing double-digit LFL at the moment and showing no signs of, of going. Uh, and China, <coughs> except possibly in our sector to do with property, has had you know, 8 to 15% type uh, retail sales growth. So there is growth out there. Brazil will be the other place. So pick the countries you go to, pick them carefully, and probably try and not do, frankly, too many, because each one takes time to learn, and you need to prioritize them. So we've got a list of countries for the 5 to 10 years. We're looking at how do we enter them, how much can we invest, uh, and, and let's pick, pick the place as we go. Second bit to look at is competitive structure. Um, for us, DIY, if you look around Europe, uh, there's more uh, floor space per person in DIY in Germany than anywhere else uh, in the rest of Europe. Unsurprisingly, returns in DIY retailing in Germany are the lowest in Europe. So we look at that and say, actually, that, although we have a share in a the business there, we would never go and enter that market because it's frankly oversupplied with space already. Uh, the similar, same is true. We get asked, you know, well, you're number three in the world now, uh, 11 billion pounds, it's a big business, why don't you go to the States? And the answer is there are two 300 pound gorillas there who you really don't want to go and mess with. Uh, there's no point, I can go and make money somewhere else. So competitively understanding, and competitively also is about understanding where people are shopping and what, what the relative um, opportunities are, which really comes from the insight piece. And spending time on insight is one of these things people always say, yes, we'll do that. And they commission a research, you know, a bit of research, and they say, I've done that, I've got my insight, and they go away. Actually really doing it. So really visiting for us people's homes, talking to them about them, seeing lots of, lots of real customers' homes, following them around on shopping missions. And the sort of insight you get, <coughs> which helps the competitive structure understanding, is in Russia, for example, and China, the traditional markets are a very big part. In fact, probably still over 50% of the market is going through traditional markets, which when we say a traditional market in Russia, what we mean is a field with a large number of containers in it. Each container has got a trader in it who is selling their particular thing, paint, 
or uh, hardware or something like that. And then in addition to all these containers, there are large gentlemen with very, very bulky underarms standing around uh, making sure that no one avoids paying their protection. So it's a really quite interesting retail environment. And if it's minus 20 in Moscow and you're going around these containers and you're being threatened by these rather large security guys, it's not the perfect shopping experience. So you sit there thinking, right, we can do better than this. Whereas by contrast, in China, the traditional market has morphed into a mega shopping mall where all these independent traders are now in this beautiful 500,000 square foot shopping mall with marble on the floor. And actually, as an experience, suddenly that's rather good. <coughs> and competitively, that's quite hard to beat. And not only that, but they're not paying any taxes. And they are probably not paying the rent that you're paying. So understanding the customer, feeding into the competitive in insight is, is particularly important. I think the final thing is, Something I mentioned, a new development, which I think is going to prove really interesting for, for retailers around the world, is you can enter markets <coughs> through an internet-only option, um, as long as the, obviously the product set is right. But as far afield as Australia, because the price structures in Australia are so ludicrous um, that actually foreign retailers can undercut uh, Australian retailers quite effectively, uh, or into big markets like the States, you can now reach people through an internet operation in a way that was not really possible 10 years ago. And I think that's got two main points to it. One is you can then do your market test and your market research and building up your social network visibility and the other things well before you ever have to put any brick or mortar down in a market. So it allows you to do a sort of heat map of well, where, where is this product gaining traction, who's actually buying it, what are they doing, and you can do an awful lot of your learning without having to go and put any investment in the country up front. There's a bit of investment on the website, multi-language, multi-currency, but really, if you're selling in English and you're, you've got a good product, you can probably go <clears throat> to most of the world. But the um, second interesting option is that you can potentially um, not even be present, in physically present, uh, in a market and still be a major retailer. And the most obvious example of that is, is Amazon, who are physically in Germany and uh, in the UK, as well as uh, in, in uh, the U US, obviously, but come out routinely in France <coughs> as top of the retail service awards uh, questionnaires uh, for customer service, product price. And they're maintaining the entire operation off the back of <coughs> the other geographies, but they're essentially trading and a significant force in France without being physically present at all. And, and that uh, may sound a bit academic, but if you're FNAC, who used to be a legend in French retailing, you know, the place you go and buy your, your records, your CDs, and your books, You're, you've just seen your profitability, you know, taken down by 75% because of the arrival of Amazon without putting their feet in the country at all. So that internet-only option, I think, is, is a viable option, and certainly for people like ASOS, uh, Johnny Bowden has been able to grow a business in, in the States without actually setting up uh, operations there as such. And, and I think increasingly you'll see a niche brand can go anywhere in the world with an internet only play. And the wonderful thing is you could be a legacy brand like us in the UK, you know, B&Q, big issues. We've got 24 million square feet of space in a retail future where space is increasingly more expensive and less relevant to its customers. If I went to <coughs> somewhere like, um, at the moment, Italy, uh, or uh, say the Benelux countries, I can go as the low cost, no overhead competitor and disrupt the local players using my global supply chain to absolutely take them out. So suddenly the competitive games are altering. Finally, um, going, choosing how to go to market, sorry, not finally, one for, um, there's huge variations on this. You know, do you go organically? Do you have a joint venture? Do you acquire someone? Uh, do you start with shipping product in? Do you then move, move on? Um, the honest answer is, uh, there is no universal answer. Individual countries are quite different. In some countries, you've got to really think about partners because you will basically be taken to the cleaners if you show up uh, as a, a sort of naive Western or a foreigner. In other countries, there are key partners which it makes sense to, to line up with. We have a 50-50 in, in uh, Turkey with the Kosh Group, which is a fantastic success, has been going since 99. Uh, what, what is wonderful about that is Kosh represent roughly 11% of the total GDP of Turkey, so they are massive. Um, they know everyone in Turkey, they've got property all over the place, they've got fantastic resources, great people. We provide the, the retailing and home improvement side, they provide to Turkey, <clears throat> and that way we've got genuine, that's Kosh Tas there, 
uh, genuinely moved the concept forward and allowed us to grow a business there, which is actually going to make more money than home base in the UK this year. So we have an operation there which made perfect sense to have a JV. By contrast, we went to go into Russia and thought, well, it's a very dangerous place, read lots about it. Again, large burly people with submachine guns tucked away. Let's be careful. Let's have a partner. And I'm afraid to say what that sort of confirmed was some of the stereotypes of the PR image that, that Russia sadly has acquired, which is that we couldn't find any partners that I actually trusted enough to actually do anything with. So we reluctantly went on our own and actually have been pleasantly surprised with what we found, because out of 18 stores we've opened and a business that's now making money, we've really only had one problem area with one of our stores, and the rest of it's been okay. But <clears throat> I would have actually, in many ways, preferred to have a risk-sharing partner in a high-risk country. But actually, if you can't find the right partner, you, you don't do it. And the partners were either financial and, and rather scary, or they were retailers who were going to tell us how to retail. And actually, if you've got confusion there, you can't do it. The last point about acquiring, um, a lot of um, people, I think a lot of finance directors really like the idea of acquiring things because it's, I know what I'm buying, I know what I can see and, and actually we can build on it. <clears throat> on the whole, unless it's an incredibly similar business, uh, I would be very cautious about acquiring unless I'd spent time getting to know the business. So a staged acquisition I think makes quite a lot of sense. But on the, on the whole, you will tend to find that, particularly in the emerging countries, people have got such incredible value expectations because growth's like this. They'll want a lot of money. They want it quite soon. You won't be able to get enough knowledge of the business um, before you're asked to buy it. And unless it's a very small business, it's going to be difficult. Um, our experience is that if you've got parallel businesses and they're big, that's fine. I mean, Kingfisher today really represents the acquisition or the merger of two businesses, B&Q in the UK, Casarama in France. Uh, that was done in 2000. It took us till 2008 to actually stop people killing each other between those two and the Civil War to finish. Um, so actually, it is much harder than people make out. Now I think we're a much stronger company as a result of that, and we, we represent, I think, a successful, if you like, merger stroke acquisition. But on the whole, they're very difficult and very scary, and they're always more different than you think you are. Final thing about going to market is um, test and adapt. Um, and just, uh, we put the, the Koshta store up here, and I can't really see it, but they basically built a series of, series of houses inside the store. This is a very much a test store. We're running test stores now in all the countries around Kingfisher <clears throat> because what we're learning is, yes, we will be more common, and we will ultimately end up with a business that's 50% common product around the world from 2% today, so we're on quite a journey. But actually, what we have to do is keep adapting, keep testing, keep changing. And most of the problems I've seen with retailers going into foreign countries is they get to a point and they think they've got the formula and then they don't adapt it. Uh, my favourite one was a German DIY retailer who was famous in Germany for their huge garden centres they had on the size of this. So you have a sort of 100,000 square foot store and about 80,000 square foot beside it of garden centres. Fantastic plants, huge ride-on mowers, you know, brilliant. Um, and then they landed in Shanghai and built a copy of their German store. And there's this surreal moment when you're standing in a sort of, uh, admittedly, only 60,000 square feet garden centre in the middle of Shanghai. And you just look around you, and there are, there, there are no houses, really, in Shanghai. They're all apartment blocks. There are no gardens in Shanghai. It's a minor problem. And, you know, the guys have just got boof, we're going to do that. And selling a ride-on mower to someone in an apartment um, <laughs> is a proper, proper test of retail skills. And what, we've, what, what I think we've said is that even on small-scale things, you know, you can always have to keep doing this because you assume things. We assumed in Russia that we would have decorative paint and wallpaper, really critical, a lot of margin comes out of that. In the UK and France, you've got slightly different percentages, but they're both important. You get, so you, put, you lay out your first three stores, you think, right, paint and wallpaper, boom, boom, uh, lay out the footages, do the merchandising, go, great. And then sort of can't quite work out what's going on because then what we hadn't really sort of focused on properly, again, in the insight, we'd sort of heard it but missed it, is that most um, homes in, in uh, certainly in Moscow are in terrible condition. I mean, you're talking about years of neglect. This is the first generation that own their own property. And one of the facts about that is that all the walls are like that. There isn't a sort of flat, clean, nicely rendered wall anywhere. So people don't paint the wall that much because it still looks like that. What they do is they put socking great big thick wallpaper on it to try and flatten it to make it work. So actually in Russia, 
wallpaper outsells paint probably two and a half, three to one, whereas in the UK it's the other way around. So we had just, just not got it. So constantly testing and adapting and trying some slightly bonkers things. I mean, building houses in there, I think, you know, that's, that's not obvious that's a good idea, but it's also not obvious it's a really bad idea, so why don't we try it? and constantly use the huge advantage retail has is that you can try it in a one store and then you can repeat it for the rest. So test and adapt because you will almost certainly get it wrong. And the final point on this is in countries like Turkey, in countries like Russia, like Poland, the market is changing so fast. If you go back now to Warsaw, compared to when I first went there 14 years ago, that has now become a, an affluent Western European city. The cars have completely changed. The clothes are better. The buildings are different. The offer that worked 14 years ago does not work there now. If you go into the depths of Poland in the countryside, it still looks like Warsaw 14 years ago. So you have to actually adapt this. And in places like Turkey, the rate of change is simply staggering because, again, media and the internet is driving convergence of taste and aspirations faster than we've ever seen. Final bit is, is focus on execution, and it's a really grim looking lot. I think Ewan's in the front of the audience there. That's, that's the extremely attractive B&Q board, it's supposed to be representing talent. Um, what I would say about this is, talent is a thing we've routinely found. If you're trying to grow a business worldwide, you really have to have good people, and that goes without saying, but you have to have people who are international enough. You have to have a sense of flexibility, a sense of interest, you have to have people actually like the country. I know that sounds really obvious, but when Walmart's acquired a Real in, in the uh, German market, they sent about 200 Americans from, uh, from Bentonville. <clears throat> and the anecdote was the sort of people were pleading not to be sent there. It was a punishment, um, basically, to be sent. So the motivation was, yeah, I'm really up for this challenge. I'm really keen to learn, and you know, I really want to respect the local culture. So they started out with, with I think, you know, maybe the best of intentions, but completely the wrong set of people. So you've got to be open. You've got to be interested. And the other thing is in talent is um, there's a lot of truth in the fact you have to run a local business. I mean, retailing is local. Even for us, 80% of our customers come from within 20-minute drive time. So nearly 900 stores around the world. That's true everywhere. What's interesting, however, is that when you're starting, you actually need people who understand your business and your DNA and, and you. So I would always overinvest in your own people going to these countries rather than trying to start out by recruiting local teams. Yes, you need local, local guys in there, but the key drivers of the business need to be people who share your DNA and who share your values and, and understand the business. And, and, and we have a wonderful French phrase we use a lot in the business called the métier. It's the, it's the craft, it's our trade. You know, and if people understand our métier, they know how this works. They can do ranges, they know how replen works, they know how we do our training programs. They actually get it. And actually, you really need to overinvest in those people up front and send a lot of people to start with, and then gradually you can pull them out once they've grown. Controls and systems. Um, controls are critical. A quick way to go wrong internationally is that you lose sight of controls. You think, oh, it's only a small business. I don't have to do too much. I don't have to have a big IT system. I, I can get away with a little bit. Overinvest in controls and systems because the mentality at the beginning is if you don't get that in first, everyone will run rings around you. And the best place for this in the world is China. They're the most inventive people on the planet, and that includes ways of getting around controls. So you have to have double the, the audit, double the controls there. Um, and the most perfect example of this was a store manager, just to prove how, how sort of well they did this. Store manager was being given a hard time because he had a load of old stock in the, in the, in the stock room at the back. And he wasn't moving it through. And, and therefore, you know, the controls were showing that he, you know, he had too much old stock. So the uh, expat ops director goes along and says, I've had enough of this stock. I don't want to see it again. Just get rid of it. And so, Next time he went back, he sort of went around the stock room and thought, brilliant, there's no stock here. Um, he went back a month later and found out that the store manager built a wall across <laughs> and painted it and had technically achieved his objective. <laughs> but uh, he got the spirit uh, slightly wrong, possibly. So actually understanding the controls bit is, is really important and really relentlessly. And I think it's something that we're used to saying, look, we trust people, we have to work with people. Yeah, but you've got to have absolutely bulletproof controls because I'm afraid that's, that's the reality of these markets. Uh, location, classic thing foreign companies do. They come in, they say, oh, I've been offered this site. And don't pause to think, well, why hasn't any of the local competitors taken this? You know, is there something wrong with this site, possibly? 
and routinely the mistake you always make, first three sites, very hard to get right. Again, overinvest in the talent in, in property. Consumer insight in detail, the point I made about wallpaper. Actually, you know, just doing the insight is fine. Actually really paying attention to the insight. What's it actually telling you? Why is it interesting? What's it doing? And the final requirement is patience. Um, it is difficult to grow these businesses. They're complex businesses. Retailing is a, you know, a, a big moving parts game. If you think you're going to make money on sort of day one, then you're probably in the wrong business. You can make money if you franchise in or you just supply, and that's maybe a way of getting in and then trying it. But you need to give yourself time to understand the market. And the huge danger is that because if you haven't done some of these other things right, you project your own prejudices onto what this market is. You know, if you go to Sao Paulo or you go to Shanghai, you'll see apartment blocks, BMWs, Louis Vuitton shops. You go, yeah, okay, this is sort of Europe, basically. And it's so not. And it takes you a while to actually figure out what of that you have to change. So having the patience, and particularly for a public quoted company like ours, being able to stand up and say, it's okay for me to lose 10 million quid for a few years in China, because ultimately this, uh, this is going to be worthwhile, or in, in Russia. And that's not an excuse to lose money forever, but you've got to have some sort of long-term view. So if you do all that, I would say global retailing is absolutely the future. Anybody who is just in a single market, unless you're a pure convenience player, ultimately will get uh, impacted by global players coming into your market or changing the rules of your game. So unless you're willing to think about your brand from day one as potentially a global player, I think you'll be missing out. But this is a lot harder than people will probably tell you to start with, particularly if you ask any form of consultancy. Actually focus on what you can do, and there are huge opportunities out there, and it's certainly our growth vehicle for the next five to 10 years of our journey is to become a truly globally integrated retailer. And if you do all that, tremendous opportunities. Thanks very much.